turn to 674, please. 674, Beulah Land. Verse 3 says, A sweet perfume upon the breeze is born from ever vernal trees. Who would like the smell of blossoms in the spring? Closely followed by the smell of falling leaves. A breeze in your face. I'll stop there. <laughs> and a crunching behind you. Okay, 674. Let's stand. <laughs> I've reached the land of corn and wine, and all its riches freely mine. Here shines a dim to one blissful day, for all my night has passed away. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where man are prepared for me and you the shining glory sure I have it my home forevermore Savior comes and walks with me and sweet communion on here have we he gently leads me by his hand for this is heaven Father, we're thankful to you this morning that we have the opportunity to gather together once again the beginning of this week and uh, give that time that you deserve in worshiping to yourself and singing praises to your name and fellowshipping with one another around our Savior, around your word. I ask that it be a blessed time, a refreshing time, a time of encouragement and in preparation for the week that lies ahead, in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Turn to 356, please. 356. He lifted me. Three hundred fifty six. In loving kindness, Jesus came.
tell he should have lifted me amen I have a few announcements this morning not a ton a song practice this afternoon lord willing from 5 to 5 30 kids from 5 30 to whenever although that's in question you gotta cancel that hon okay stand down on that one some of the participants aren't feeling well We'll skip that. Prayer service Wednesday night. Kids Compass again on Thursday at 6. Looking forward to Deacon's meeting at Jim's November 14th. Week and a half away. Don't forget Tuesday, uh, election day. Also, there's a sign-up sheet for the Thanksgiving supper, which will be Friday, November 29th. At six. Well, that's on the back table as well. Also, uh, the gift box for Pastor Raju is back there as well. Somebody wants to contribute. I don't see anything else on here. Jim, would you mind taking our offering this morning, please? mentioned to those of you visiting uh, that our offering is a chance for our members to uh, support the church and its ministries. Do not feel in any way obligated to contribute. You're our guest here this morning. Go ahead and pray. Amen.
Turn to 365, please. 365. A child of the king. Good for us to remember the status of a child is not typically one of responsibility and authority in a family. You know. The family of God. I'm just his kid. 365. Father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child. singing about, remember when Peter and the apostles were fishing, and they hadn't caught fish all night, and then all of a sudden they had boatloads of them. They didn't know what to do with them all, right? They barely dragged them to shore. Did God care how many fish Peter had? I, I mean, maybe some. That wasn't really the point, though. Um, the point was, Peter, I got way more fish than you can ever use, so just, just come talk to me for a bit, okay, buddy? All right. All right, let's turn to Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 4. We've been looking at the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, and this morning I'd like us to concentrate on how that efficiency or perfection of Jesus Christ enabled us to enjoy a new condition 
once we're redeemed by His blood, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that puts us in a new condition, and uh, the perfection of Jesus Christ enabled us to enjoy that position. Ephesians chapter 2 does talk about that new position that a person has once we're saved by Jesus Christ. So beginning in verse 4, we'll read down through uh, verse 10. If you'd follow along while I read. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he may show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not by good works, but to perform good works, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It was God's, uh, uh, what God had planned beforehand, that how we should live, we should walk in, in those good works as, as we're saved by Jesus Christ, created a uh, new person by Christ. So anyway, we're going to look at uh, that new condition that we have as, as believers in Christ and hopefully that will be an encouragement and a blessing to us, uh, especially this Thanksgiving season. All right, let's open in prayer and just ask the Lord to open the scriptures to us. Our Father, uh, there are some wonderful truths in your word. Uh, sometimes it just takes some time to meditate upon them, to think upon them. And uh, we do rely upon your Holy Spirit uh, to open the truths to us, because these are things of yourself, the things pertaining to yourself. And it takes the Spirit of God to know the things of God and to open them up and to show them to us. Uh, we don't, we're not, they're not naturally discerned and naturally understood. Uh, and so we do depend upon your Holy Spirit to work this morning to open these truths. Uh, we ask that as he does open them, that we'll receive them. And a lot of the truths we look at this morning, Lord, are really refreshing and encouraging truths that would lift our hearts and lift our spirits and, and uh, cause us to uh, really appreciate you and what you've done for us and for the position that we have now after we're saved. And I pray that uh, we'll enjoy that and be thankful for it this Thanksgiving season. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Amen? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Always good to be in the house of the Lord. I think it's probably one of my fondest places to be. So we're looking at uh, a new condition that the person saved by Jesus Christ can enjoy. Uh, before we really delve into that much, I'd ask, have you been redeemed by Jesus Christ? You know, that's the beginning point, isn't it? We ask ourselves that question. Have I been redeemed? That is, bought back, ransomed, the, accepted the ransom that Jesus paid for my sins, accepted that for myself and my own sins personally, and received the Lord Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that price that was paid to, to rescue me from Satan's grip and from eternal damnation and condemnation of God. So have you been redeemed? Have you been made safe from the penalty of sin? Delivered out of that? Have you been delivered from the captivity of Satan and his kingdom of darkness? Because that's where we all, what we were all born into. And we need to be delivered from that. And praise God, he loved us. And he was filled with mercy. And he, by his grace, sent his son Jesus Christ to pay that penalty for us and deliver us from that if we would just accept it from him by faith. So it, if that is true of you, it is good to know these things and to know that they are true concerning me. Uh, and I would trust that uh, you can all say yes. Yes to these things I know. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb because that's the only thing that can redeem us. That being said, I'll be talking to those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. If you have not been, please get that settled. Uh, if you have been, then follow along with me this morning and rejoice in what you have received uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, hopefully, it will uh, maybe ignite a, a, an appreciation in our hearts and a joy in our hearts. I'd like to move us on for, uh, a little bit from, being, from the fact of being what we've been delivered from and begin to look into the things that we've been delivered into. Uh, God would have us presently enjoying this new condition as being saved by Jesus Christ. And we can presently enjoy it. Uh, but you know, we can't enjoy something if we're not really conscious of it and not really fully aware of what it is. And uh, this Thanksgiving season, we're often mindful of the material blessings that we have uh, the blessings that affect our bodies primarily, 
But you know, uh, it is good for us to enjoy the blessings that affect our spirit and our souls and our bodies. You know, there are blessings we have in Christ Jesus that, are, that affect not only our bodies, but our soul and our spirit as well. And if uh, that's our entire being, then our entire being is blessed of God. Uh, what we're going to do uh, this morning is maybe take some uh, pieces from different places in the New Testament, because you'll find in the New Testament there are scatterings of, uh, of facts relating to our new positions that we have, our new condition in Jesus Christ. And so you can take something from Ephesians, you can take a little bit from Galatians, you can take some from uh, uh, Colossians and different places, and uh, it's like a puzzle. You know, you have all these pieces scattered on the tabletop like that, and uh, pretty soon you take this piece and that fits with that one, you put those pieces together, and pretty soon you got a picture. And you say, oh, that's a, a good complete picture. And it didn't look like a complete picture with all the pieces here and there. And that's what I'd like to do this morning is take those pieces of truth here and there in the New Testament and pull it together and give us a, a full picture of what we are and the position we have in Christ Jesus. So, uh, let's just ask the Lord to do that for us and then let's, go, let's get going. Father, thank you for the chance to study your word. Help, help us to be able to draw these uh, different truths, these pieces together, and paint a good, vivid picture for us of our new condition that you've put us into. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin with our new state that we enjoy. And uh, we could say that that's our condition, but it, it is a, a state that we we enjoy a state of being that we can enjoy today. And first of all, it is a state of life as opposed to a state of death. We're not passing from death unto life. If you're saved by Jesus Christ, you have passed from death unto life. And that's a new state. That's a state you were not in before. You were in a state of death that eternal damnation, condemnation of God, that eternal penalty of sin, to be eternally separated from God, because death is, is just separation. We think of it as physical death, our soul and spirit separated from our body, but death also includes spiritual death, where our souls and spirits are separated from God. Spirit, soul, and body separated from God for all eternity. That was the death we all were in. And we have passed from death unto life. Let's turn over just a couple of pages from Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to uh, spend some time in Ephesians 2, but like I say, bits and pieces elsewhere. It's not good enough for me just to get up here and say these things without backing of the Word of God. What we need to do is have the backing of God's Word, that this is what God says we are. In Colossians 1, in verse 13, well, verse 12, let's start with verse 12, and go down through verse 14, actually. 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father, that is God the Father, we now have that relationship with Him, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins we have the forgiveness of sins so we have been delivered from the power of darkness and we have been translated into the kingdom of his son Jesus Christ we are in a new kingdom that's a new state of being. And that is ours today. You've been saved by Jesus Christ. You are now no longer in the state of death. You are in the state of life. Everlasting life. As not being passed from death into life, you have passed from death into life.
All right? Uh, we also have a new state of being new creatures or new creations. You know you're a new creation <laughs> once you're saved? Ephesians 2.10 says that, doesn't it? For we are his workmanship. Workmanship means we've been made into something by God. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are created in Christ Jesus. When we're saved, we have been recreated into something we weren't before. We had a, one creation uh, when we had our physical birth, but you know, uh, when Christ saves us, we are now a new creation. He created us into something we weren't before. And it took God to create that. We cannot create our own physical life, neither can we create our own spiritual life. And so we've been created by God into something we weren't before. God did that creating work. It is His workmanship. And this is important. Uh, if we turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We don't have to turn too many pages to pull the pieces together for us, but sometimes a little more than others. 2 Corinthians 5, Five, verse 17. Therefore, if any man, that's you, me, any man, be in Christ, if we're saved, if we're in Christ, if he has saved us, he is a new creature. If you're in Christ, if you've been saved by Christ, you're a new creature this morning. You're a new creature now than what you were before. Old things are passed away. What you were before is gone. It's passed away, it's dead, it's no longer existing. Behold, all things are become new. Everything is new to you. Thing, everything has changed. Everything, everything has changed once you've been created in Christ Jesus. Life is different here. Eternity is different. Everything has changed, and it's changed for the better. One way, uh, another uh, thing that is true of our state is that we are under no condemnation. That's from Romans chapter 8. Imagine, you were under condemnation when we were in our sins. No, no not anymore. That's a, we have a new state that we can enjoy. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, uh, excuse me, there is therefore now, presently, now, right now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Our walk has changed once we're in Christ Jesus. We no longer walk after the flesh. We now walk after the Spirit of God. Uh, that's a change that the Lord makes in our lives. But that verse clearly says, there is therefore now, you right now this morning have no condemnation of God upon you. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. That's, a con that's the condemnation of the law. Condemna condemnation of sin unto death. For what the law could not do, it cannot make us righteous. All it can do is condemn us, punish us. For what the law could not do, and then it was weak through the flesh, God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So now we're under no condemnation, and God is working that the righteousness of the law would be fulfilled in us. And that is done through by walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. The important point I wanted to make, though, is we have a new state. We 
are under no condemnation. And God has established a new law for us, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That new law is now operating regarding us. We're no longer under that old law of, of sin and death. We're operating on a new law of the Spirit of Christ. And that law works in us and for us. All right, so we are now under no condemnation. We're also delivered from the root and the fruit of sin. The root and the fruit of sin. We have been delivered from the punishment due to our sinful state, which is the root of our sinful practices. We were born sinners. By, and at birth, we were sinners, and that's how God saw us as sinners. But we now have a new state of righteousness in the eyes of God, because God has clothed us with Christ's righteousness. So, uh, we have a new root, you might say. We've been delivered from that old root. But we've also been delivered from the punishment due to the sinful practices that we uh, engaged in as sinners. And that's the fruit. So we've been delivered from the, the condition of being a sinner, which is the root of sin, but also from the fruit of sin of those practices that we engaged in while we were in our sins. In that sinful state. So God has delivered us from the root and the fruit of sin. And we have a new state of ability to perform good works. You know what? Any effort to perform good works before we're saved by Jesus Christ are just filthy rags. The Bible tells us that. In God's eyes, they're, they're just filthy rags. Their efforts on, on a sin fallen, by a sin-fallen man to try to gain acceptability with God by their own works and their own efforts. And God does not find that acceptable. But you know, once we're saved by Jesus Christ, it is possible now for us to do works that are acceptable to God and um, are rewardable by God. That's a tremendous thing. That now I can perform good works <coughs> that God finds acceptable and he will reward them in his time. So our works have changed. Let's look at Galatians 5, 19. That shows a contrast here between what we, the works we used to do and the works we can do now. Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I don't think he missed much there, but he says anything that's like that, uh, the works of the flesh. Now you got, he painted a pretty good picture for us, so he got a good idea of what the works of the flesh are. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are in Christ 
they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and loss. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So that's uh, the difference between the works uh, that are produced by the Spirit of God and the works that are produced by our old sinful flesh. And uh, we have the ability now to do those works that are of the Spirit of God that are pleasing and acceptable to God. So that's our state. But let's move on to our new identity. We know we not only have a, a, a new state, we have a new identity. We had first identify with Christ's body. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Not that one, let's see. That's the one I had before. Uh, Colossians 3.3, 3, I'm sorry. Let's try that. Well, I don't know. Now, it's good verses anyway. It's not the one I was particularly thinking of. But, um, um, I think it's, uh, it would have to have to do with his body. Um, Anyway, uh, anyway, let's read Colossians 3.3. 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So if, we're, if our life is hid in, uh, with Christ in God, we are in Christ. And if we're in Christ, <laughs> we say we are in his body, in his person. And we are. Uh, we have a new identity as the, as the body of Christ, and uh, as that, we can take our place in the body of Christ, which is his church, the local church body. And that's, it's important we all know our place, where we fit into that body of Christ, his church. But we have a new identity, too, in, in that we have a new family that we're part of. You know, our, our family is much a part of our identity. And we are now members of a new family, the family of God. But we are also identified as God's, as a special people to God. We are now part of a very special group of people drawn out of the world by God himself. And I will look at this one, I guess. Lord willing, 1 Peter 2.9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, it's not what we will be, it says that's what we are. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, this is how God sees us today once we're redeemed as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. In other words, we have been set apart by God to be a special people for Him in this world. And we have a special work God has chosen us to perform in this world. And that is to show forth the praises of God that delivered us from darkness into his marvelous light. And being part of this special people, we need to be zealous of good works. 
zealous of good works, because uh, Titus 2, 11 tells us, uh, through 14 tells us this, about Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Yes, as that special people of God, uh, we ought to be zealous of good works, desiring to see us uh, filled with a, a, an ardent desire for good works. That's what God would have us do, to be filled with an ardent desire to perform good works. All right, so we have the state. We also had, have looked at um, the identity, but now also our new assurance that we can enjoy. Assurance is knowing. It has to do with confidence. We are no longer wondering if, but we're knowing. You know, before we're saved, we might wonder if this and wonder if that. I hope this and I hope that. But that's different than knowing and being absolutely sure of it. And there are things that we can be absolutely sure of. I looked up in the, in the New Testament and found that there are 21 times that it mentions there are things that we know as Christians, as believers in Christ. That is, we are absolutely sure of them without any doubt. We know them to be fact. We know them to be true. A couple of them. One is 1 John 3, 19 that says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. All right? We know we are of the truth. How are you going to know that? By checking yourself with the word of God. You're going to know you're of the truth when you check yourself with the word of God and that matches up. So... And then 1 John 5, 20, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is God. He is uh, eternal life to us. And we can uh, know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding and we may know him that is true. Yes, we can know Jesus Christ and we are in him. We can know that we are in him. And those are things that we can know. We can know certain things. And we can know that we have eternal life. From 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. He's writing to people who have believed on the name of the Son of God. You that believe on the name of the Son of God. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Right? He wanted them to know that fact that they had eternal life and to believe on the name of the Son of God. And so that's assurance that he's talking about there, that assurance of eternal life. So we have a new assurance that we can enjoy, but we also have a special care and guidance we can enjoy. And in that special care and guidance, we have great company. The Lord Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Can't get any better company than the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I am with you always. Always. There's never a moment in this life that the Lord Jesus won't be with us after we're saved. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You never have to wonder, is the Lord Jesus Christ here? Is the Lord here with me? Is he with me in this trial? Is he with me in this difficulty? Is he with me in this sorrow? Is he with me in this joy? Is he with me in this journey that I'm on? Is he with me in in this task that I have to face? I am with you always, is his answer to that. I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. With it, we also have special support. Let's 
good to have the Lord's presence. <clears throat> but you know, with that presence is special support. In Romans 8, 31 tells us, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? God is for us. If you're in Christ Jesus, God is for us. That's a lot of support. It's a lot of support. In fact, you can't get any greater support than God himself. If God be for us, there is no one have to worry about any being against us. So that's a special support that he gives. In his presence, yes, but he's not just present. He's for us. He's working for us and helping. So that brings in the special care, too, that he brings. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You're under the special attention of God as believers in Christ. He cares for you. He's not just interested in you. He cares for you. And that's a big difference. And it tells, invites us to cast all our care upon him. You know, that's quite a friend. There aren't many friends like that. They say, you've got something bothering you? You can put it all on me. I'll carry it for you. Lord Jesus Christ is probably the only one that can say, cast all your care upon me. Now, through life, you may end up with a lot of cares, but every single one of them can be cast upon the Lord Jesus. And Matt mentioned Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Yes, he can. Why? He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He can relate to us. He can relate to those difficulties. He went through them himself. So he can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Because he's felt them. We have special care. We also have special guidance. The Holy Spirit that indwells us. He gives us guidance. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So we have the special guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have special guidance from the Word of God. That's something that we didn't have before. And we have special provision. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Not some grace, all grace. Whatever is needed, God is there to provide. And then as we go through life, we'll need different things at different times and different kinds of help for different kinds of needs. But it says there that God is able to make all grace abound toward you. No matter what the need is, there is grace there to meet it. That ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, all sufficiency in all things, you have whatever you need in everything, that we may abound to every good work. So that's divine provision enabling us to accomplish every single thing that God would have us go through in this life. We can fulfill it in the way that is pleasing and honoring to the Lord. And we're invited to come and get that help any time we need it. From Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of, of need. Yes, we can come there. We're invited to come and get whatever grace, whatever help we need from God. So that's a, a, a very special provision. It's an open door to the throne room of this universe to the God that has the power to help in every situation, in every problem of life. That's a very special provision. And we have the ability to enjoy predictable outcomes. And we know that 
all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's a predictable outcome. Everything, all things, God is working together for good. The predictable outcome is it's going to be good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Oh, it's wonderful to have predictable outcomes that no matter how dark it looks today, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how confusing it looks, we know the end result is going to be good. Because God said, I'll work it together for good. It's not very many people that can have predictable outcomes like a believer has because of our position in Christ. Work all things together for good. Oh, wonderful to have a to know what's going to come out of all these things, isn't it? It's a predictive. It's predictable because we're told ahead of time what it will be. Um, there is a point, though, that I'd like to make with this, and I came across it in my devotionals devotions this week. It's in Jeremiah chapter thirteen. Because I think this highlights the kind of struggle we go through. Even though we know uh, we have the predictable outcome that it will be good in the end, that God has a purpose for it all, it is accomplishing something through these things that we're going through, it's not always that clear to us. And uh, in Jeremiah chapter 13 and uh, the first nine verses, I thought was a good illustration of of how life is to us sometimes. And how God's working in our lives are, are, are confusing sometimes. So uh, the Lord is telling Jeremiah to do something here in chapter 13. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle, and put it upon thine loins, and put it not in water. I'm just trying to picture Jeremiah here receiving this word of the Lord. And the Lord says, uh, telling me, go get a girdle and put it on your loins, but don't put it in any water. Well, does that make much sense? I mean, stand alone by itself. You say, what is God? What, uh, what is the purpose of this? It seems like a, a silly thing to do. But you know what? Verse 2 says how he responded to that. He could have said, well, this sounds ridiculous. I don't know what... You tell me, what, what is this all about anyway? Well, he doesn't get that. Verse 2 says, So I got a girdle, according to the word of the Lord, and put it on my loins. Well, praise God. Sometimes we don't get the full picture all at once. He says, this is what I want you to do. Well, it doesn't make any sense, God. I don't know why you want me to do this. But I'm going to do it anyway. So I got a girdle, I put it to the word of the Lord, and I put it on my loins. And it wasn't until he did that that the Lord gave him the next thing. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. Well, that clarifies things, doesn't it? You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You just told me to put this girdle on, not put water, not put it in any water to wear it. Now you're telling me to go to the Euphrates, take it off and bury it and hide it in a hole of the rock. None of this is making any sense, Lord. You know, why am I having to do these things? Why am I having to go through this exercise and we might be tempted to just say, oh, I'm just, I, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to go on with that. But praise the Lord for Jeremiah's response in verse 5. So I went and hid it by Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Sometimes we may not understand what God is asking us to do, but we just got to go and do it anyway. And it came to pass in verse 6, after many days... So um, there's a period of time here where that seemed to be the end of it. And I expect Jeremiah was sitting there, what was that all about? Sometimes we don't have the answers, do we? 
right off. We don't know why God is doing it. came to pass after many days. I don't know how many. It just was a lot of them. Confused. What is God doing? Why, is he did, why, did he, why did I have to go through that? Why did I have to do that exercise? That the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I have commanded thee to hide there. All right, now I've got to go back and dig it out of the rock again. And he did it. You know, praise God. Sometimes what God asks us to do doesn't make any sense, but by the grace of God, go and do it. Just go and do it. Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. And this is when the Lord began to show him what he was trying to teach him. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. You know, sometimes the Lord has to take us through practical things in life that we don't understand to teach us real spiritual truths. And that's what he was doing with Jeremiah. But praise God, though we may not understand each step of the way, and though God uh, is working in mysterious ways sometimes, we can have predictable outcome because God has said he'll work it all together for good. All right? In the end, it will make sense. There is a purpose in it all. God does not work and ask us to do things without purpose. And he's going to make it good. And then we also have absolute security that we enjoy. You know, security differs from assurance. You can be secure and not assure. You can be on a parachute (laughs) and be secure in that parachute because it's a reliable parachute, but still lack assurance in the parachute. (laughs) Be scared all the way down, right? This is, oh, I wonder, is this going to hold me up? It may be perfectly secure, but we can all wonder all the way down to the ground if it's really going to hold us up and, and support us as it needs to. So there is a difference between security and assurance. Assurance is, is just being confident that we are secure, right? So we are safe. We are kept by God. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And that's where we're seated now, with Christ in heavenly places. So, these are just some things I pulled out from the New Testament here and there. But they're all true concerning us when we're saved by Jesus Christ. Every one of these things are true. A little bit here and a little bit there. But I trust as we pulled a little here and a little there, that you begin to get a picture of just what a wonderful position we enjoy in Christ Jesus. There are tremendous privileges that we have that we didn't have before. We're a different people than what we were before. We're a different creature than what we were before. We're part of a different family than what we were before. We are joined to the body of Christ like we weren't before. That we have his care and his protection that we didn't have before. And uh, we, can, we have that throne of grace we can boldly go into and obtain grace to help in our time of need, no matter what that is. I mean, what God has poured out to us is his very person. And we have access to him and all that he is. And we have it today. We have it right now. It's not like we're passing from death unto life. We have passed from death unto life. Father, thank you for... Uh, time together this morning. Thank you for time to spend considering the sufficiency of Christ to bring us into this condition once we're saved. I pray that we will enjoy that condition and be thankful for it, rejoicing in it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 363 is our closing hymn.
363. And we'll stand and uh, We'll sing one, two, and five. One, two, five. Okay. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior King, since I have been redeemed. Since I I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies, since I have been redeemed, to do his will my highest Christ, I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed I will glory in my Savior's name verse 5 I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed, where I shall dwell eternally, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I have, I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. Our Father, thank you for showing us the new condition that you've brought us into through Jesus Christ. Pray that we will enjoy that condition. We'll live in it and, and uh, also be thankful for it this Thanksgiving season. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.